Hey, thanks for joining us for another edition of Retire Smarter. This is Walter Storholt alongside Tyler Emmerich, Wealth Advisor and Certified Financial Planner at True Wealth Design, serving you in Northeast Ohio, Southwest Florida, and the greater Pittsburgh area. Find us online at truewealthdesign.com. We're going to be talking about cash on today's episode, so stay tuned for that. More on it in a moment. But first, Tyler, what's up in your world? Well, not much, Walt. Doing all right. Kind of hanging in there. We're starting February, trying to get through winter, and hopefully we get a break in the weather here um, pretty soon. I was telling Tyler that I uh, bought a new house this weekend, and he admitted mm-hmm. that he is still unboxing from his house move <laughs> a couple of months back. So I think now we need a little like uh, we need a little side competition, Tyler, of who can unbox the last box first. <laughs> <laughs> get there first to the finish line. I, I don't know if I want to commit to that. Um, I like my chances you based on how long stop. it's taken you. <laughs> <laughs> you have a hard stop at the end of February, so uh, I, I can't commit uh, t- to that uh, time frame. I'm, I'm waiting for the weather to break, a little sunshine, and, and a little more activity uh, are, to get are, done. Are you the but... style that lives amongst your boxes, or do you uh, find a room <laughs> to just like shut her off and, and pl- you know pile everything into there? Yeah, a little bit of room and shut her off, I think is probably okay. the, the, the best bet. And then eventually getting back to it and, uh, you know, going through and sorting through it. But uh, yes, <laughs> well, that, that's at least one style. We're still stuck in the actually living among the boxes. So we're, <laughs> I tripped over one this morning trying to come into the uh, recording today. And so it didn't break an ankle, but made a loud noise no, nice, and, I'm, nice and early in the morning. <laughs> I'm, pa- I'm past that stage. I guess there, in the basement, there might be a small corner with a, maybe a box or two in it. But gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, uh, let's get to today's uh, conversation and uh, dive in because it's an interesting topic as the kind of, I don't know, economic markets are, are maybe shifting a little bit. The headwinds are, are changing. There's mm-hmm. lots of predictions of which direction things are going to go here in 2023. And it's got, it sounds like, just based on conversations with you, it's got people asking you guys at True Wealth Design a little bit more frequently and often now about cash and how much mm-hmm. is the right amount to have on hand since things are starting to change a little bit. And this is, I think, a good just sort of general financial and retirement planning question. We get into Mm -hmm. what, like emergency funds and just wondering how much should you kind of have on the sidelines and, you know, are you missing opportunities? All those kinds of questions in a normal environment pop up. But now we can Mm -hmm. kind of view everything through a whole new light as well. Right. I mean, you look over the last 18 months with just a rapid rise in interest rates, um, those interest-bearing cash positions, which a little farther back had been giving minimal to no interest, and your checking and savings accounts are, are definitely now paying higher rates. I mean, uh, it seems like every day I run across a new commercial or an ad, you know, marketing a new CD, a savings account, really trying to advertise those new higher rates. And yeah, they're, they're replacing the crypto commercials from 2022 <laughs> that we saw. They are. I could do without the crypto commercials coming back, though. Yeah. But uh, I, uh, I hear we, they're out uh, on welcome, the Super Bowl okay. this year. It's it's much much more heavily uh, alcohol commercials apparently. So right. <laughs> That's a sign of the back, times. Back to the norm. <laughs> back yes. to the norm. But uh, yeah, and we, we, I mean, we get it. Um, we understand that we haven't earned interest rates this high for, I was looking back through the data almost 15 years before we've seen, you know, interest rates uh, and checking accounts and savings accounts get to the level that we're starting to see. But before we kind of jump the gun and say, hey, cash is the new king, you know, we thought we would give, uh, that'd be a good time to give our perspective and a little bit of insight on, you know, how we approach that uh, decision on you know, how much cash is the right amount of cash. And, you know, when I look back through all of the, the textbooks for my CFP and all that stuff, I mean, I think the general rule of thumb is, you know, three to six months is the one that we traditionally heard. I don't know if you've heard that one before, Walt, but that's what we probably run into the most. Yep. Three is, to six months seems to be the, the word on the street over the years. Mm-hmm. Yep, three to six months worth of spending. Um, you know, as with anything, as we get a little bit more granular into that, we and peel back the onion a bit. I think it can be very dependent on really your household and family dynamics. You know, if I throw out a two situations to you, Walt, like, hey, you've got a family of two teachers who have very reliable income, have worked in their jobs for a number of years, versus you know, two individuals that are sales professionals that have five rental properties. I mean, mm. you know, I think it's pretty clear there which one's going to need more cash reserves, right? Yep. Good point. 
it comes back to that variability in income, variability of expenses, um, and you know, kind of how that works on your family. Um, and that is kind of how we back into that right number. You know, the two teachers with very consistent, reliable income, maybe they only need a few months worth of uh, expenses set back in cash. Whereas, you know, if you have a lot more expenses going out, a lot more variable income, or maybe, hey, you have some large expenses coming up that you want to certainly prepare for. Those are some of the, the things or the situations where we might say having a little bit more in cash makes makes sense. But at the end of the day, I think it definitely comes back to you know, a personal situation and what's going on in your household. I think the current market environment with these interest rates, as we kind of alluded to, you know, helps tens or, you know, people are thinking about, okay, hey, how do I take advantage of it? And should I have a little bit more in cash? Uh, I've got more than a couple handfuls over the last six months of emails, um, you know, kind of asking, hey, should I, should I get into a CD? And boy, uh, two, three years ago, I don't think I got any questions about CDs. Oh, yeah. Because the rates were so low, right? Right. What's, what's a CD? Uh, Who needs that? <laughs> exactly. But uh, I think the, the, the ad and the marketing that I'm seeing the most is, you know, like a one year CD at around 4% right now. And um, individuals are looking at saying, hey, 4% might look pretty good. Um, but again, as we kind of dive into that situation, when you think about the CD rates and uh, how the yield curve is positioned right now, um, one thing you got to always be mindful of before you put your money in a CD is, well, what's that lockup period? Um, because they're there's some risk there. Um, yeah, a, you look at those rates right now and, you know, a high interest or a CD, some of the higher ones are paying on for a three month, you know, maybe four, four and a half percent. But you go down and go to a three year CD that might be paying 4.7, you know, three month to three year, there's really not that much difference for locking up your money uh, for a long period of time. Uh, so as you kind of look at that lockup period, when we look at the CD rates right now, you're the, really the juice is not worth the squeeze when you look at locking your money up for a long period of time because those interest rates for short term and long term are so comparable. Makes so, a lot of sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking through and saying, well, what are some good alternatives? Um, and, you know, one of the ones that we've looked at are just a high yield savings account. I mean, you go and Google high yield savings account. I mean, you're going to see a whole host of options come up that are FDIC insured, um, where these banks are offering pretty sizable rates. I mean, I see them in the high threes, uh, close to 4% which that can be a good option because you're not looking at and you don't have any lockup period. Uh, so that liquidity is still there. And for some individuals that have you know, kept maybe a little bit more in cash, we've looked at robo cash management services. Have you heard that term before, Walt? Or is that I mean, like robo, robo advisor? Pretty, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So automatic, you could think of it as that, but basically it's a service that might attach to your current checking account. And what they would do is they would go and shop around the highest FDIC insured rate that you huh. can get for that upcoming month. Um, and they partner with a whole host of banks and they look within all those banks and you can optimize that cash for a month and say, hey, within my current checking account, I'll place it with this bank have the FDIC insurance and get the highest rate. And then they would look at it again the next month and the next month, and you'll be able to you know, shift behind those. And as the interest rates change and different banks offer better rates, you'll be able to take advantage of that within the program banks that they work with. Am I actually hearing a financial advisor say something positive about a robo advisor? <laughs> I would say positive. Hey, it's an option. Okay, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think it works in, in, in some good situations, right? I mean, you, you, I, you I was gonna say it. it might be a first, it might be a first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, well, you look at the alternative and go into a high yield savings account, what do you think is the likelihood of you if you go and open up a new savings account, because that's the one that's paying the highest rate? Do you think two months down the road, you're going to look and go open up a new savings account and transfer your money to the new bank, because it's paying more? It sounds like a nightmare to try and do all that. Right. So those cert those cash management services are kind of doing that for you. They're going to charge you a fee to do it. So you got to make sure that that fee offsets and is fine in your situation. So it's kind of um, like having but, an insurance broker who's going to shop you different rates. And then each mm -hmm. year, you instead of kind of sticking with one insurance company for a really long period of time and getting those discounts of like loyalty discounts, you say, no, nah, you just each year, I'm fine switching to a new insurance company for the vehicles, whoever's given me the nice introductory cheaper rate. And then boom, next year we can shop it again if need be. You got it. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Well, that's so, different. 
Absolutely. And that's maintaining that FDIC insurance as well. Um, some other alternatives that we've done as well is you, you look at like treasury bills, for example, um, you can get into a, a T-bill ETF, uh, the 90 day yield on something like that's uh, just under 5%. Uh, so you're looking at a pretty nice and sizable interest rate uh, for a position like that. And they're v- extremely liquid. You can get your money in and out very quickly if you needed it. Um, and you also have some you know, risk or some opportunity, depending on what interest rates do, to maybe even have some more appreciation uh, as far as price goes in those types of investments as well. So treasury bill ETFs, I think, would be another um, you know option or alternative to those CD rates that we're kind of looking at and exploring with some of our families. And you know, I think all in all, Families do a pretty good job of, or at least the families that I've talked to do a great job of really understanding those cash levels in their checking and savings accounts. But I think what becomes a little bit more difficult is those cash levels in retirement accounts, so Roths, IRAs, investing accounts, 401ks, and the like. A number of years ago, I was introduced and and, and met with an individual. He had come in, he'd give me a call and said, hey, I'm looking for someone to give me a second opinion um, on what I'm doing and the advisor that I'm working with. You know, so he came in and we met, had a great conversation, uh, went through his uh, situation. And at the time, he uh, really wasn't ready to, to make a move. He actually did, decided not to hire us. Um, he wanted to stay with his current advisor. Yeah, he had known his current advisor for a number of years. Uh, they had a great relationship, very personable. Um, and the way the relationship typically worked was, you know, he would go in and meet with the advisor once a year, uh, they would come in, talk about the portfolio, maybe make some changes. Uh, the advisor would recommend a couple sells or buys, and they might do it or they might not. And then they would rinse and repeat and do that again the next year. Obviously, if the individual had, if he had a question, he could always call the advisor. Sometimes he'd sell, you know, make a call and sell out of an investment or whatever the case may be. But that was the relationship that, that worked with him. I actually got a call from him a few months ago. He wanted to come back in because, I mean, boy, it's been almost four years uh, since our first meeting, Mm. and he decided to stay with his first advisor. And I was like, yeah, great. And only a few things have happened in that four years. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Too many to count, right? Uh, But he's like, hey, I just wanted to check in again. You know, wanted to get an update on my situation and just talk through a few things. So I was like, sure, come on in. Uh, so we sat down and, you know, we're chit chatting and uh, talking through everything. And I'm, he brought in his statements for me to look at and I'm going through and he's got a handful of accounts, right? So I'm going through each statement. I'm looking, I'm saying, all right, hey, you know, Roth, 20,000 in cash, uh, IRA, about 30,000 in cash in there. You got about 10,000 in your trading account. So, so on and so forth, right? I mean, I look up and I'm like, hey, did, did you know you had over a hundred thousand dollars just sitting in cash across your investment and retirement accounts? You know, and he kind of took a step back and was like, well, yeah, yeah. you know, I think he knew it, but you know, o- over time, you know, he, he kind of, we had a, got into the conversation a little bit and over time he just, Hey, you know, at the end of 2020, we had a run up, I made a sell in a position and then just didn't buy back in. I had some of my dividends that were going to cash. They just didn't get reinvested. It was almost by happenstance. Um, you know, when you're only looking at those portfolios once a year and you're maybe making changes or not, you know, sometimes that cash can get, you almost fall through the cracks a little bit. Well, uh, because they're not, they're not looking at it. Right. And if you have five or so, I mean, in his case, I think he had over five accounts. It's like very, very easy. And you know, one account, you just look at it and say, ah, it's a small cash position. That's not too bad. But then you add them all up, you know, it can be a bigger issue. And, you know, I just did some quick math for him. I was like, I looked back over the last few years and, um, I was like, like, well, you've been averaging almost 10% return per year in your accounts. I mean, you got a hundred grand uh, in cash. If it's been sitting there for as long as you tell me it has, I mean, you're giving up almost 10K a year in interest. Uh, it's not a small chunk of change, mainly due to you know, almost inefficiency, let's call it, right? Because he wasn't deliberately just saying, hey, I want to leave it in cash because of X, Y, Z. There was no real plan around it. It just, the cash had eventually, it just had built up over the years. And when you kind of put that dollar and cents to it, um, and you look at that, it's like, wow, um, that's that's a big deal. Um, in the industry, we call that cash drag on a portfolio. Okay, cash mm-hmm. drag. Cash drag. Dragging down the portfolio, Uh, kind of. Dragging down the portfolio returns. Yep. So cash costs investors returns in the long run because it's not invested. In any given year, I mean, we can't time it. We don't know what's going to happen in any particular market. I understand that last year we're coming off of some historically bad performance, both in the stock market and really specifically in the bond market. But 
still, um, you start adding up these years, there's a reason why we come up with diversified portfolios and we want to stay invested and we don't want to try to time the market. Um, and cash is really just paying the risk-free rate. Um, so you're giving up opportunity costs or investment returns in the long run if you have too much cash in your portfolios. Don't get me wrong, cash is useful in portfolios for liquidity, it has low transaction costs and stability, but holding that too much really does eat into those long run returns. I mean, you think about the market environment we've experienced over the last few years since I had talked with him. Um, you know, there's been many ups and downs, but you still look back over his performance and you know, in aggregate, he's had some pretty nice performance over those years. And that's what we're getting at from that cash drag uh, standpoint. I, in the news uh, over the last few years has been uh, a lot of news on like one of the major bro discount brokers uh, in our industry, um, Charles Schwab, you know, they have a certain amount of cash that had to be required in some of their portfolios and some of the services. And they've gotten a lot of pushback uh, from the industry and the SEC and all, all these different regulators saying, hey, is that right? You know, should they require a certain amount of cash be held in portfolios over the long run? Because, you know, you look at their situation they might have had some benefits for keeping cash and they might have made some money off of it, um, and, but they weren't maybe charging fees for the portfolio. So there's, uh, there's certainly a give and take here and you got to be a little bit careful. But in aggregate, when we look back on those historical performance and those historical returns, we feel much more comfortable having your money invested and being very deliberate uh, about the amount of money that you're keeping in cash. Great discussion so far on uh, mm -hmm. all of these different kind of cash considerations. And I never, I guess, realized, uh, Tyler, that this kind of cash conversation went beyond just really that emergency fund feel to mm -hmm. it. But it, it's much deeper as you kind of layer this into talking about, um, you know, retirement and lifestyle and maximizing, you know, returns of that cash and different ways to use it and manipulate it to, to your benefit and lots mm -hmm. of different kind of uh, areas of your financial life. You got it. I mean, you think about a retiree. I mean, when you retire, what's the first thing you got to kind of come up with, right? You got to, where are you going to get a paycheck from? Yeah. How are you going to start distributing assets out of your accounts? And that's another area where I think that the way you set up that distribution strategy, um, it, it kind of plays into that whole cash drag conversation. You know, you, you take a scenario where, okay, maybe I just do a large distribution from my IRA account at the beginning of the year, I live off that asset. And then at the beginning of next year, I do the same thing. Well, what you're doing is, is you're pulling a lot of money out in investments at the beginning of the year, sitting it in cash, and then slowly spending it down. That sort of goes against what we were talking about with that whole cash drag conversation. Um, and, you know, the approach that we take typically uh, for our families is, you know, we, we really would like to identify those expenses that are recurring on a monthly basis and set up some type of recurring monthly withdrawal out of your retirement account so that way you can kind of match your spending with the withdrawal. And then for any big, large purchases that you might have come up throughout the year, you know, do those distributions as needed. So for example, you know, you might have a family where they are spending $5,000 a month and they're doing about $15,000 of gifting per Per year to you know their church or charity so you, you take that situation we might set up a monthly withdrawal out of their ira five thousand a month they've got that and then at the end of every year we'll do a large distribution uh, to take care of their gifting needs for that particular year um, and we'll use those monthly distributions as times to do some opportunistic rebalancing inside their portfolio because as you think about it every time you do a, a withdrawal out of your account it's got to come from somewhere Right, um, so you got to really look and be deliberate about okay, which investment do I sell out of? Do I sell out of the stock? Do I sell out of a bond? Um, and what's going to be most uh, beneficial as we kind of look at that situation? And then two, how much should we keep in cash to meet that next monthly distribution? Should we have three months set aside? You know, some some companies do even longer than three months, um, but we tend to run our cash uh, reserve levels very tight uh, because we don't want to um, have that major impact from the cash drag. All right, very good. So any other uh, cash elements we should be aware of or, or angles to consider on today's episode? No, I think those are the big ones for today. Okay. Um, I think the big takeaway is just be deliberate okay. um, and about what you're doing and, and make sure that you take the time to understand like, okay, my cash just isn't my checking and savings accounts. Yes, we want to optimize that through some of the solutions that we talked about today. Uh, make sure it fits in with your overall portfolio strategy. Uh, but don't forget about some of those other places cash can build up 
uh, inside your accounts and making sure that you're utilizing them to your benefit. The question today is, of course, how much is the right amount of cash? And so if you need some help getting the answer to that question, as always here on the show, it's going to vary from person to person. So if you need help figuring that piece of the puzzle out as it relates to your financial and retirement plan, reach out to the True Wealth Design team. You can do that a couple of different ways. One is the phone number, 855-TWD-PLAN, 855-TWD-PLAN, or maybe the easier way, go to truewealthdesign.com and click on the Are We Right For You button to schedule your 15-minute call with an experienced advisor on the True Wealth team. Again, that's truewealthdesign.com, and we'll put that contact information in the description or show notes section of today's show as well. Tyler, thank you so much for your help and the guidance on the show today, and we'll uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. It's been great. Talk All to right. you soon. Very good. That's Tyler Emmerich. I'm Walter Storholt. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Retire Smarter. Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Information is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accurateness and completeness cannot be guaranteed. All performance reference is historical and not an indication of future results. Benchmark indices are hypothetical and do not include any investment fees.